Welcome. It's good to see so many familiar faces and a few unfamiliar faces. For those that don't know me, I'm Jeff Salas. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at St. John's Help. Um, I, had, I just hit my year mark. It's been just a little bit over a year since I started. <laughs> Um, again, for those that don't know me, um, I've been in healthcare for about 20 years. Uh, my wife, Rachel, and I, we have four kids. We've moved all over the country for different job opportunities and worked in six different states, but Jackson is the first place we've ever chosen as a place to live because we love it so much. And um, because I was the CEO at Ermac over in Idaho Falls for many years, uh, I became more and more acquainted with St. John's, and it's just a fabulous organization. And the first year has been so wonderful. Um, I have just a few things I want to touch on, but mostly tonight is about our providers and talking about our oncology services. So I will be as quick as I can be. First, I need to thank some really important people here in the room. I need to thank um, our community. We have so many community members that have shown up. I need to thank some existing or former patients that have that we've seen at St. John's. Uh, I need to thank all of my colleagues across St. John's Health, but in particular, our colleagues that work within the clinic space, including our on oncology uh, department. Um, I don't know if you know this, but our medical group, the St. John's Medical Group, continues to, to grow year over year. And more and more of our services are moving from the inpatient environment of our hospital and into the outpatient space. And so uh, at this point, um, we have now three primary care clinics. We have uh, one year-round urgent care clinic. We have two seasonal urgent care clinics, one in uh, Grand Teton National Park and one at the Village. And the Village Clinic is very busy this time of year. Um, and we have over a dozen specialty clinics. So as you think about St. John's Health, it really is more than, than just the hospital. Um, finally, I want to thank our trustees, both uh, our, uh, from our, our board at the hospital and uh, our trustees from the St. John's Health Foundation that are here tonight. So we just completed our strategic plan. It was a huge, huge effort. Um, we started the strategic planning process in May. And really, it started before then, when I arrived at St. John's and, and started gathering information and formulating what needed to happen to help us be successful. And I think this cycle of our strategic plan was a little bit different than any other we've been through in the past. And what I mean by that is that we really made a deliberate effort to reach out and try and get input from as many people as possible. I'm not sure, but I think it would be a safe bet if we were to quantify the number of people that we, we received input from, we know in the community, just from our community members, that it was over 400 that provided input. But it was, it'd be probably close to a figure of around 1,000 people that provided some or a lot of input into our strategic plan. And while it required a lot of effort, that was really important to me, important to our board, important to our larger leadership team, that we gather as much input for our strategic plan because it is our community's hospital. And we don't forget that. We are just stewards of this amazing resource that we have here in Jackson. Um, and I'm grateful that our final plan was just approved last month by our board of trustees. And so we are running and in many ways have already put a lot of groundwork down to help us execute on our strategic plan. Um, We've had a very busy recruitment year. We've recruited um, these two providers that you see on the screen this past year. Uh, we've added an additional internal medicine doctor in Christina Gallup over at the, the Wilson Clinic. We have Jonathan Boltax, our first full-time pulmonologist that, that joined us as well. And we have, in December, we added a gastroenterologist in Dr. Woods. So we are busy and continue to continue to recruit as part of our strategic plan. Um, I need to talk about how really um, we would, I would be remiss, our team would be remiss if we didn't thank those of you who have been so generous with your support in helping us succeed. And what I mean, what I mean by that is part of what makes St. John's 
so special is that we have a foundation and a foundation that's supported by our community with philanthropic efforts. And this has been kind of a banner year as I think about our partners in the oncology space specifically. Um, I just met Blair for the first time. Where's Blair? There's Blair. Uh, thank you to you and your great organization for an incredibly successful Stripping for the Cure event this past year. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, there's another group of amazing women that uh, have a tremendously successful event at the Pines um, in Tee It Up, and they also had a banner year and helped us raise more money than we've ever seen. And through our partnerships, uh, we were able to raise over $330,000 for oncology this year, which is the best year we've ever seen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Finally, um, and this is the most important part, we get, we get to, hear to hear from these wonderful women and incredibly smart providers tonight. Um, I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna hand this, this mic over to Dr. Caulfield, our general surgeon, breast surgeon, trauma surgeon. So Dr. Caulfield. Can you guys hear me? I'm a little shorter than Jeff. I gotta bring that mic down a bit. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and being here tonight. Uh, I'm Hannah Caulfield. I'm a new general surgeon uh, at St. John's and I'm really excited to be here and to get to know some of you this evening. Um, we, we kind of designed this event so that we got to, to meet some of the community. Um, we're meeting a lot of people in clinic and we just wanted to be able to have an opportunity to get to know some of the foundation members and other people outside of work. So a little bit about me. Um, I am from uh, Putney, Vermont, um, born and raised there. Um, went to the University of Vermont for undergrad and for medical school. I met my husband, Baron Reyes, who some of you may know um, at the University of Vermont. He is a emergency medicine doctor at St. John's, um, has been here for about nine years. After medical school, we moved to Arizona. We did our residency training there. And uh, Baron has been working here at St. John's for about the last nine years, and I've been in Pocatello, Idaho. I was building our Oncoplastics um, breast program over there with the main goal of helping women and their families be able to have care close to home. And so I'm really excited about being here and building a program to help women stay close to home uh, in Teton County. Um, both of my grandmothers had breast cancer and my dad had pancreatic cancer, so the kind of oncology space of um, surgical care is something that I care a lot about um, and I'm really invested in and I'm excited to be part of this team and what we're gonna be building over the next few years. So um, I've kind of scaled back so that we can have a kind of big picture um, view of screening, a little bit about genetics, um, and then how does cancer form and kind of what do lifestyle modification and things like that contribute to that? as well as specifically tumor suppressor genes. So these are a lot of the genes that we hear about um, as kind of the genetic link to breast cancer and how they actually contribute to cancer risk. So screening. Um, when we're talking about screening, we're talking about imaging that we do um, or exams that we do um, to help try to identify cancer at an early stage. Okay? Um, when we're talking about um, screening though, we have to risk stratify people. Um, are you average risk, increased risk, or high risk? Because that helps us decide what's the best way to screen you. Um, and so screening tests need to be, um, they should, need to be relatively easy to do. <laughs> some, some people may debate if, wh whether or not mammograms are easy to do or not. Um, <laughs> but, um, and they need to be really sensitive, meaning they have a low false negative rate. So for your average risk woman, Lifetime risk of breast cancer is about 12%, or one in eight women. So that's really high, right? It's much higher than other types of cancers. And it's why breast cancer gets so much attention, because unfortunately it is really prevalent um, and something that has um, probably impacted the lives of every person in this room, whether as a family member, friend, um, or personally. 
So like I said, average risk, 12% lifetime risk. Increased risk, um, we're talking about your 20% plus lifetime risk, 20 to 40%. Um, and so these are people who often will have a family history, but not a genetic predisposition. Your high risk category is your um, greater than 40% lifetime risk. Um, and a lot of those patients can even have 60 to 80% lifetime risk. So one in two are higher risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. And so the screening that we do for, for people in each of those categories is a little bit different. So for average risk women, we start breast cancer screening um, at about the age of 40 or 45, depending on which um, guidelines you use. And it's typically done annually. There are some guidelines out there that talk about doing it every other year. Um, as providers who work in oncology, that makes us very nervous because we frequently will see women who have been getting regular screening mammograms um, and something pops up. Um, and that's what, how we want to find it. We want to find it early when it's um, really treatable and curable, um, where every two years you're finding stuff at a much later time. And so that I'm not, I'm not a fan of the, the two-year uh, recommendations that are out there from some of the guidelines. Um, I think one of the big questions is when do we stop screening? Um, so national guidelines typically look at the age of 75. Um, here in Jackson, you'll see that we often continue to screen both for breast cancer and colon cancer and other malignancies longer. We have a really active fit population that lives longer than the average US population. And so that has to be taken into consideration when we're make, making kind of personal decisions together um, with our patients as far as when we stop screening. For your increased risk or high risk patients for screening, um, typically they're getting biannual screening and it starts younger. Um, uh, typically 10 years um, younger than the first diagnosis in their family um, or at 20. Um, and we're doing um, screening every six months, so mammogram once a year and MRI once a year for breast cancer. For um, younger women, they have really dense breast tissue and so mammograms um, can be um, less sensitive in de dense breast tissues and so ultrasound is often used in conjunction with the mammogram uh, for their screening. Surgical prophylaxis. So that's something that we think about for patients who have um, increased risk or high risk breast cancer, typically a greater than 40% lifetime risk of breast cancer. They can be considered for surgical prophylaxis. And that means a bilateral mastectomy with or without reconstruction. Um, a mastectomy offers a 90% risk reduction in their lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Um, so it, never 100% risk reduction, but 90 is pretty good. When it is um, combined with uh, removal of tubes and ovaries, it is now a 95% life risk reduction in their lifetime risk of getting breast cancer, which 95%, that's a pretty big um, you know, level of risk reduction. Um, so again, not, not for everybody, but for, for people who are um, you know, that high risk category, something that um, we can do to help mitigate their risk. Uh, I've just put up here the uh, U.S. Representative uh, Task Force and the American Cancer Society recommendations. Um, I think this thing points. There we go. Yeah, it works. Um, so you'll see here they're talking about um, starting at about age 40 to 45 um, and then um, greater than um, 50. Um, but I think the biggest, uh, greater than 75, but the biggest thing with deciding when to stop screening is we, we kind of, we have to make educated guess, um, sort of how long we think that you're going to be around for. Um, and obviously that's a decision you get to make with your provider. Um, and it's based off of family history, how long do people usually live in your family and your health otherwise. Um, and if you have another decade or more to live, then we keep screening. Because um, we don't want to do unnecessary tests that are you know, cumbersome, painful, um, um, or problematic for, uh, for other reasons if it's not going to improve or prolong your life. Um, so this is looking at mammograms. So uh, for 1,000 people who get mammograms, what's going to happen to these women? So of that um, 1,000, 100 will return for additional um, uh, mammograms or ultrasound or imaging. Um, sometimes that'll be like spot compression views um, to get a more detailed look at a specific area of the breast. Of that 100 who get additional imaging, 61 will have that additional imaging and find out nothing's wrong. We just needed to take a closer look. Things look good. We'll keep a look at this again next year. Um, of that um, 100, 
20, we'll find out that it's not, not cancer, but we probably should look at it again sooner, meaning we'll look at it again in six months. Um, and we'll talk in a second about BIRAD's rating scale, so kind of how we look at mammograms and quantify their results. And so these are your BIRAD's three patients. Um, of that 100 who needed additional imaging, 19 needed to have a needle biopsy. And of that 19, five were diagnosed with breast cancer. So screening is thankfully really effective at finding breast cancer. And if it's being done every year, really effective at finding breast cancer when it's early and again, treatable and curable. So a little bit about BIRADS. Um, so there's a BIRADS rating scale and it's how our radiologists help us quantify um, what we're seeing on imaging. BIRAD zero is we don't have enough information. We need to do additional imaging. That's that 100 that needed to have additional imaging. Um, BIRADS one is everything looks great. It's, it lo all looks normal. BIRADS two is it's a benign finding. So it's a cyst, it's a fibroadenoma, not something we need to do anything about. We're confident that that's what it is based off the imaging. We'll see you next year. Um, BIRADS three is this, it's probably benign, but we're not certain. So we wanna see you back in six months so we can make sure it's not changing. Um, BIRADS four is suspicious, BIRADS five is highly suspicious, and BIRADS six is biopsy proven malignancy. Um, for the BIRADS four, we recommend biopsy, and the, um, most of those patients will end up having a benign finding. Um, and as long as that's concordant, meaning what we're seeing on the biopsy and what we saw on the imaging match and what we'd expect, then you're done and we see you again next year. Um, for some of the things that are BIRADS four that are benign, they're they still need to come out. Um, and that's things like introductal papillomas um, or um, areas of um, atypical hyperplasia. Um, and those bec are because even though we see something benign on the biopsy, we know that about 15% of introductal papillomas, for example, there's a, a malignancy that's hidden there. And so about 15% of the time when we go to excise an introductal papilloma, we'll find an invasive malignancy. All right, genetics. So I think it's something that has gotten a lot of media attention and press attention about kind of all this genetic testing. Um, and a lot of people, well, how much does it actually contribute to breast cancer? About 15% of the breast cancers that we see are thought to be genetically linked. That means most of them, 85%, are not genetically linked. It's just a feature of being a person who has breast tissue um, and has estrogen, right? Because estrogen is one of those kind of big um, you know, lifetime exposure kind of risk factors for breast cancer. So only about 15% of them are linked to these inherited germline mutations, so meaning a mutation you got from mom or dad, typically in families that have pretty strong family histories of, of cancer uh, and not just breast cancer. Um, a lot of these uh, genes can be associated with other kinds of cancers as well, ovarian cancer, sometimes colon cancer, melanoma, pancreatic cancer, things like that. Um, what are the other causes of breast cancer, right? So having breast tissue, um, having estrogen. Um, men can get breast cancer too. Um, they have uh, much lower uh, rates and risk of developing breast cancer, um, but they do have estrogen as well, um, just at much lower doses than women. Um, so hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, that's the HBOC. Um, we kind of use that um, as a lump sum to talk about some of these genes that we've identified that um, increase one's risk of developing breast cancer. That's things like BRCA1 and 2. A lot of people have heard of those, PLB2 and CHECK2. And there are thousands of mutations associated with BRCA1 and 2, PLB2 and CHECK2. So it's not just one, one mutation. It's at a specific spot um, in, in the genetic material, um, but there's lots and lots and lots of variations that can happen that can lead to a pot potentially pathogenic variant. Um, the Human and Genome Project, um, as we're all kind of familiar with, is, oh, the, air, the vent just turned off. Do you guys hear that? <laughs> Can y'all hear me better now? Um, so the, the Human Genome Project was obviously really important and impressive um, just from the standpoint of all the, the information we learned from kind of mapping out all these genes, figuring out what part of DNA does what things. Um, but even more than that, it's been a huge advance from the standpoint of our ability to replicate and study genetic material. Um, genetic testing was really, really, really expensive 
um, even just 15 years ago, um, as that ability to um, replicate genetic material um, has happened, it's been a lot easier to um, do genetic testing, which means it's also a lot less expensive, and it means it's a lot more accessible to people. As we're testing more people, we're finding out more and more genes um, that we didn't know about before. Um, and so that's why once we've done genetic testing, if, it's, if, you, if you have this family history that's really concerning for potential um, um, genetic predisposition to cancer, even if you tested negative and we're seeing you and it's been 10 years, we'll often retest you uh, because there's lots of new genes that have been identified since then. Okay, so moving on from um, um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, we're gonna talk a little bit about how cancer forms, how cancer starts. So cancer starts when one cell, um, and it's typically thought to be one cell um, as opposed to a group of cells because when we see in cancers, we see clonal behavior, meaning um, most cells, um, is particularly for women, we have two X chromosomes, right? And so one of the Xs will be turned off and we see the same X turned off throughout that kind of clonal. So that kind of gives us some information that probably came from one cell that had this error or mistake and now is growing out of control. So normally, cell cycle reproduction, when the cell decides to make a new cell, stop making new cells, it's a really highly regulated um, process in the body. Our body is really strict about when this can happen, when this can't happen. Cancer happens from a change to that to a cell, um, either by DNA damage that now lets that cell grow out of control, or by promoting um, increase in that uh, cell. And it usually help, starts with one mutation, and then once it's sort of been able to bypass the rules of the road that usually turn off um, that cell dividing, it can now grow out of control. Um, and as it grows and continues to grow and replicate, it acquires new mutations and more and more errors, and that, unfortunately, is what leads to kind of the dangerous part of cancer. Um, and it's because you now have these cancer cells that aren't really doing the job that that cell's supposed to do, replacing the healthy cells so you don't have those cells there to do that normal function. They're being kind of pushed out by these um, cells that are growing too quickly and not doing that, that normal, important function of that part of the body. Um, a lot of um, research is, looks at, you know, what are these things that cause these DNA errors to happen to, be, uh, to begin with. Um, carcinogens are part of that, um, and this is the kind of part that I think a lot of people have questions about, of like, what kind of lifestyle modification things can I do to help, um, you know, reduce my risk of, of cancer? So kind of the typical carcinogens we think of are things like radiation, chemicals, molds, tobacco smoke. Tobacco smoke um, or tobacco products in general um, account for about a third of all cancer that we see, at least as a contributing factor um, in the U.S. Viruses and toxins. I put alcohol up there because I think it's one of those things that, um, people often think of alcohol linked with um, specific, you know, liver um, cirrhosis, liver cancer, things like that. But there's actually a dose response, um, uh, meaning the more alcohol consumption over a lifetime, the kind of increased risk of cancer. Um, I enjoy a, a nice glass of Chardonnay um, in the evening, um, so I'm not saying no alcohol is just one of those things that we know um, that, that there is a dose response. So the more alcohol one has, the kind of more we worry about that. All right, so tumor suppressor genes. So hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, so that 15% that of, of breast cancer um, is linked to these tumor suppressor genes. So tumor suppressor genes are these uh, genes that help regulate the cell. They're part of that process of kind of um, making sure that cells divide when they're not, when they're supposed to, but not divide when they're not supposed to. Um, and mutations in those genes result in loss of function. We typically think, because we, we typically, uh, it's an autosomal dominant, right, uh, inheritance for tumor suppressor genes. We have two copies of each gene, one from mom, one from dad. Um, and so one copy's been turned off because of this tumor suppressor mutation. And then there's a second um, mutation or loss of function related to second hit, and that's typically thought to be secondary to carcinogens or other um, kind of functions that aren't genetic. And so those two things together result in that um, cancer now being able to grow out of control. Um, and it makes it uh, more likely for people to have those um, genetic predispositions to cancer to have 
um, faster growing and more aggressive cancers than ones that happen from kind of senescence and aging of the cell. Um, kind of, the, this is my, my, take it back to the, to the good news. Um, this is the five-year sur uh, cancer survival rate for women um, based off stage. So stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Um, and as you can see, the five-year survival rate for women with stage one and two cancer is actually pretty good. Um, when women have breast cancer identified at an early stage um, um, on screening mammogram, a lot of the time they can't feel this. I can't feel this even though I know it's there um, when I'm examining them. They have a really high um, chance for you know, being in remission, for, for cure and long-term survival. Um, and that's what we want. That's why we will want women to get screening. We want to find these things when they're really early, uh, treatable, and curable. For most women who come in with a diagnosis of breast cancer, they have some options when it comes to surgery. Okay? Um, and the two main options are lumpectomy with radiation or mastectomy. Lumpectomy re means removal of the tumor with margins around it. Um, typically can be done through really small incisions that can be hidden um, and um, hopefully leave the breast um, looking the way it did or better than, than before. There's things that we can do um, combined with a lumpectomy to actually um, um, uh, lift or reduce the size of the breast um, to um, improve cosmetic outcomes. Um, when I talk about lumpectomy, I say lumpectomy with radiation. Um, lumpectomy as a surgical treatment, local treatment alone without radiation, has a really high recurrence risk. Radiation is really important um, for reducing that risk of local recurrence. Even if you have negative margins on pathology, um, without, without radiation, the recurrence risk is um, in, higher than 20%. With radiation, it's closer to 10%. So still not zero, but much better. For uh, women who choose mastectomy, that is a removal of um, all of the breast tissue, or as much of the breast tissue as we can. Um, women can have ectopic breast tissue in the armpit and things like that, so we can't always remove 100% of the breast tissue, but that's the goal, right, is um, to reduce the risk of future um, uh, malignancies, both recurrence um, uh, and uh, as well as uh, future primaries. Um, and so women have those options um, for when looking at comparisons between um, the less invasive um, lumpectomy versus a mastectomy, they have relatively equivalent um, survival rates. So that's good news um, that women have options and they can kind of choose what's best for them. And I, that is all that I have for you guys. These are my fur babies, um, Amato and Phoenix. Oh, and, and Baron, that's my husband. <laughs> well, I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Cohen. Thanks, Dr. Caulfield. That was really great. What a great review of genetics and of screening and um, of our surgical options. Today, I was going to talk to you a little bit about our program at St. John's because what I thought was a little small community hospital has really turned out to be a very robust program full of surprises and opportunities for our local community. So I'm very impressed. I'm going to talk to us a little bit about that and also an update on kind of what's new, some research that's out about what we can do and how we're changing our recommendations and treatments of breast cancer. So I wanted to Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit and give you an introduction about who I am, a little bit about our services, tell you a little bit about our affiliation with Huntsman Cancer Institute through the University of Utah and what that means for you as a patient or you as a community, what that offers you, and then tell you some what I think is very interesting um, information that's come out at the various oncology meetings this past year, particularly with respect to screening in early breast cancers, ways when we have small tumors that we're actually de-escalating our care, and in the, some patients with early breast cancer who have high-risk forms of early breast cancer, how we're escalating to try to save more patients, and in metastatic cancer where we're developing our most um, sort of interesting novel therapies. So a little bit about me. I'm a board-certified medical oncologist. I've been working in oncology for over 15 years. I was, prior to moving to um, Jackson, an associate professor of medicine at the University of California in Los Angeles. And I was fellowship trained there. And my residency was at the University of Colorado because I was sort of raised in Aspen, Colorado, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to come back to a mountain community. And I went to medical school in George Washington because I was actually born in Washington, DC. Um, this is a picture of my family. Um, my husband is here in the audience. Um, and I have two teenage daughters. <laughs> uh, my husband and I are both from Colorado, so the, when, when I saw a job post of, do you want to be an oncologist in a ski town in the Rocky Mountains, I was like, sign me up. 
Um, and my two wonderful daughters, one is in high school and one is in middle school. And they are both love to ski and are um, pretty happy with our move here to Jackson. So I've been here since July um, of this year, um, and it's been great. Um, this is a picture of the oncology department. Some of us, not everybody, but I wanted to tell you we, it's an outstanding group. Not only are we fun, this is a picture um, of us at Halloween this year. Um, it's a very festive group of people, but as festive and as excited as they are about decorating or dressing up for holidays, they are committed to patient care and making sure that the patients get the best standard of care and everything that we can do possible. There's an outstanding follow-up, in, um, incredible intelligent women. So now I'm here. I'm a full-time medical oncologist. Before, they had about four days of um, oncologist support um, a month. Um, but the clinic is gifted with two outstanding oncology-certified nurse practitioners who've really held down the fort with, I would say, it's not been minimal support, but with very little direct access to physicians. The physicians have been very committed who've been coming up from Huntsman here. But they are outstanding, incredibly smart, um, and have been holding the fort down. So we're very lucky to have two oncology certified nurse practitioners. In addition to our nurse practitioners, we have two oncology nurse navigators. That means if you get a diagnosis of cancer in our community, you have two nurses who are, you know, Bachelor of Medicine certified nurses who have experience in oncology who will hold your hand and help you coordinate all your appointments. Oncology and cancer is a scary field. There's lots of appointments. There's lots of different practitioners. And to know that there's a two-point people who are educated and who can help guide you through this process is an outstanding um, addition that, you know, I didn't even have at UCLA. Some of the, um, so I think that that's a, a real um, asset to our, our oncology department. In addition to our two, two nurse navigators, we have a clinic coordinator who kind of keeps everybody in line. Um, she's here tonight, and she makes sure that, you know, when you come in, your orders are there, your, um, the infusion center is working um, smoothly, and helps um, streamline all the communication between the infusion nurses and the providers and the patients, and then also the nurse navigators. So she's really essential. In addition, I didn't put our clinic manager on here, but she's amazing and one of the first people I met when I came here and really drew me in. So thanks, Casey, for all your hard work. She didn't. Um, in addition to our manager, coordinator, nurse navigators, and nurse practitioners, we have four full-time oncology and chemotherapy certified um, infusion nurses. And so you're going to see a familiar face when you come into our facility. We have some float nurses, but majority, um, we have um, four full-time um, oncology certified nurses. We have one outstanding social worker, if you haven't met her, Caitlin Webb. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the services that she navigates um, and how that really benefits our patients. In addition to all these supportive services, we have a financial counselor. Um, cancer is very expensive, so when you get a diagnosis of cancer, we have somebody who helps you navigate between your insurance company and authorizations in your cancer care here at St. John's. In addition to our financial counselor, we also have a certified nurse assistant. Um, she's going to be your point person when you check in, and the front desk person who has a great sense of humor is able to do anything that you need done um, in the Cerner system. So from start to finish, you're going to have an excellent experience in our department, and it's very flush with um, uh, amazing women with, who are really dedicated to their work. So. Um, at, at St. John's, in addition to great staff in the oncology department, we provide lots of services in addition to your traditional chemotherapy and your hematology and oncology consultation. We can give intravenous immunotherapy, we give oral and IV targeted therapies, we provide blood transfusions, platelet transfusions if that's necessary, bone strengtheners for patients with osteoporosis, IV antibiotics if it's needed on an outpatient basis. Um, some of our nurses are capable and competent and um, um, qualified to put in PICC lines, and we maintain a lot of PICC lines for the community in addition to our, um, our own cancer patients. There's nutrition counseling and a whole slew of supportive services that are available. Um, I'd be remiss without talking about our amazing, amazing um, women's imaging center that we have at St. John's. Um, St. John's is the only place in the region that has received this um, award. It's called the Comprehensive Breast Imaging Center. It was actually just, the name of it was just changed. It's actually a standard of care that was developed and is granted by the American Care 
College of Radiology that your clinic and services have met a standard of care that is um, the highest standard with respect to quality. And, um, and St. John's has that for, and we have it for all of our services, for, for mammography, for stereotactic biopsy, for breast ultrasound, and breast MRI. Um, I'm really impressed, coming from you know, a hospital in the city, what I've been really impressed is, is the rate in which patients are diagnosed here. Um, the turnaround times are so quick. So a patient is often, from the time of an abnormal mammogram to getting into the clinic to seeing us, is a matter of a couple of weeks, and they'll have had their biopsy and their diagnosis. And that's unheard of in a big city. I mean, one of the, I always say, my husband is in finance and gets all these benefits to go to fancy hotels and, you know, comped meals and things like that. I was like, what is the benefit of being a doctor? Like, there's no like sort of strange benefits. But one of the things when you live in a big city, like having somebody who can pull you in and get your scan on time, it, it's a real huge benefit. And I always thought, oh, that's so good. But here at St. John's, the whole community has that benefit. If they have an abnormal mammogram, they're not waiting a month or six weeks to get their, their follow-up mammogram. So that period of anxiety is really lessened for our patients. One of the benefits of being in a small community, but also having access to quality um, radiology services. So in addition to our amazing, um, basically breast cancer is what I call a multidisciplinary team. When you get a diagnosis of breast cancer, you're gonna have a lot of doctors who are involved in your care. You're not gonna just have me as a medical oncologist. You're gonna have someone like Hannah as a surgical oncologist. We're really blessed here that you can get a diagnosis of breast cancer and have the, your mammograms and your ultrasound and your MRI and your biopsy and then your surgery and go home each night into your own bed in a small community um, where we live, which is great. In addition to doing um, you know, the lumpectomy or the mastectomy, Hannah is able to do some limited reconstruction here. So it's really great. And if you've ever seen any of her incisions, they're quite small. And she's really thoughtful about where she places the incisions. So the women have outstanding cosmesis, which is really important when you get a diagnosis of breast cancer. You don't want to feel deformed. You already have been changed and have so much stress in your life. And to have a beautiful sort of cosmetic outcome of something that's so scary and difficult um, really provides a lot of peace of mind. Um, in addition to surgical oncologists, we have radiologists who specialize in reading our mammograms and um, MRIs. I put Dr. Haling here because whenever he's out of town, it seems like it's a week before we get our answers on our patients. He's really essential and does a wonderful job in doing breast biopsies. And I know a lot of the radiologists also are involved also in our breast reading. Um, there, the next two pictures are of the two radiation oncologists who are sort of on loan to us. They come up sort of part-time from Idaho Falls. That's um, Dr. Miller and Dr. Holt. They are radiation oncologists, and they come up and see patients here part-time a couple days a week, every other week, um, and are able to offer consultations for our patients regarding radiation after surgery, or they take care of some of our patients with metastatic disease who have painful sites of metastatic disease. They offer their radiation services um, primarily, our patients do have to travel to Idaho Falls, but there are some um, limited patients who are offered brachytherapy for prostate cancer. That's an effective treatment for very early and small breast cancer tumors. Those can be done on site. Um, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, those are um, typically can be managed with brachytherapy, and that can be done at St. John's. But for majority of uh, the rest of our radiation that occurs sort of after surgery in a breast cancer patient who is in a curative setting, they would need to travel to Idaho Falls for now. Um, one of the things that I'm committed to, and I'm just also following the lead of the oncology department that's been established here before, is that one thing you can be assured when you walk through the doors in our clinic that you're going to get a personalized care plan um, where we're gonna be utilizing all the expertise that we have available, and we're gonna do so in a compassionate manner. Um, one of the things that my hope for um, all of our breast cancer patients is that we're going to be able to prospectively manage them, meet with a multidisciplinary meeting. We meet every other week on Thursday to discuss our patients prospectively so that we can come up with a treatment plan with all the doctors in a the room. There's a pathologist, the radiologist, the radiation oncologist. They're available via Zoom, Dr. Caulfield and myself. In addition to my whole supportive staff is there so that they're aware of the, pro of the treatment plan ahead of time. The social workers will often point out difficulties with transportation and the nurse navigators will know details about the family that's going on. So having these meetings every two weeks is ensuring that we have 
the highest level of personalized care in, in a prospective way so that we come with a unified treatment plan for our patients, which um, we're really working on, um, on, on developing that, and now we can. Um, um, one of the, uh, the other thing that we um, offer, which I think is very unique to our program, is our supportive care program, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And one of the other things that should be very reassuring to everybody in this community is that our oncology center has had an affiliation with the Huntsman Cancer Institute um, since, I think, its inception. I actually don't know when it started. And that's in a relationship where Huntsman facilitates um, us utilizing their resources so that we can prove that none of our, case, none of our cancer patients go without. Um, I'm going to first, before I talk more about the affiliation, I want to talk about our survivorship services. This program is, um, is generously supported um, by the St. John's Health Foundation, um, and it's coordinated by Caitlin Webb, our um, social worker. What we're able to find and identify through our many meetings and interactions and our close relationships with our nurse navigators and our patients is the need for counseling or any toxicities from the, the therapy. We often have you know, free or at a discounted rate um, therapy for our patients so they can see a counselor or their loved one could see a counselor. They can have acupuncture or massage or um, healing touch or physical therapy either at a reduced or dis, uh, discounted rate or sometimes a scholarship. There's yo um, yoga and Pilates for cancer patients that we offer. We have support groups. Caitlin has organized some amazing um, wellness retreats that I can't wait to go on. I'm going to learn how to fly fish and go whitewater rafting. And um, all of this is centered around bonding cancer patients to one another so that they feel a sense of community um, and not just empathy, but, uh, but also, you know, um, gaining friendships and relationships with other patients going through the same thing. We have a wig boutique. And again, all of this care is either available via scholarship or through some form of financial assistance based on your, your need. And there are applications that she helps sort of manage and coordinate. It's an outstanding um, array of services that are available for our patients. I think it's really unique um, to our cancer center. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Huntsman Cancer Institute. Um, all of you probably know, but Huntsman Cancer Institute is a, the cancer hospital associated with um, University of Utah. It is an, a National Cancer Institute, or NCI Institute, designated comprehensive cancer center. So it's designated as a center of excellence. Its sort of catchment area includes you know, Utah, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, and Wyoming. Um, we have access by our relationship to them to over 300 clinical trials in oncology, um, and we also have access for our patients in um, specialists in oncology care. I am a general medical oncologist, and when I have a patient who has a complication, they'll have the ability to meet with a tumor-specific oncologist at Huntsman, sometimes via video visit, sometimes with the direct visit. But then I will work and liaise with that specialist oncologist for that patient so that they can stay in their own community and receive their care close to home, but still have sometimes some of their major medical decisions made by somebody who's treating only, let's say, kidney cancer or only um, liver cancer. There we also have access to specialists who do things that are above and beyond the sort of our pay grade at St. John's, things like liver resection or yttrium, which is a type of radiation that's delivered to segments of the liver, um, and some of the more complicated um, surgeries like a Whipple for pancreatic cancer. Um, and so one of the things that Huntsman commits to in our relationship is identifying a patient coordinator that makes these transitions and appointments seamless for our patients. It's difficult enough to know that you have to travel five hours or to have sort of um, disjointed care, but to know that they've identified somebody whose sole purpose is to ensure um, these patients have smooth access. Um, we had a patient who has a history of breast cancer. Um, it's metastatic. It's involving her bones. She also has pleural effusions from her cancer. Her cancer's doing beautifully. Everything's improving, but her mobility of her shoulder's really impaired, and she continues to um, develop fluid in her chest. 
And so we were able to orchestrate, this um, patient coordinator was able to orchestrate on the same day a drainage placement as well as a consultation with the um, orthopedist on the same day. So she only makes one trip and gets to see both providers. And they're ensuring this coordinator that all the records are transferred. Huntsman can actually see everything that's going on in our system. We can't, we have log on all of, all the members of our staff have access to University of Utah records so that we can, before we see a patient, we can scrub the University of Utah record and see anything that's transpired there to maintain and make sure that the continuity of care is there for our patients. Um, oh, one of the other things I'd be remiss without saying is Huntsman has developed numerous training programs for their staff, for their nurse practitioners and their oncology nurses, and so we're able to take care of those um, training programs for our staff here so that we don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel and can um, join on to their education for doctors as well as for the, our nurse practitioners and nurses. Um, what I sort of see for our oncology program, as you can tell, it's already quite robust. There are little sort of changes. Um, one, we're looking towards um, increasing numbers. I'm very flattered already at the number of people who've been willing and interested in coming to see me. I think our rates of patient visits are up anywhere between 25 to 30% um, in the last six months. Um, one of the things I think is short on the horizon is that we're looking, um, we are not just looking into, but we are committed to um, purchasing a, I hope I can say that, Jeff, um, a diagnostic quality PET CT. Um, currently our PET CT scanner is in a mobile trailer home that comes on Wednesdays and our patients sort of go into this trailer home and as you can see it's a, it's a good scan but um, we can definitely get a better scan with a diagnostic quality CT that's attached to a pet that's in-house and that's something that we I think have the, the money to do and the plans to do within the next year um, and when that um, pet scan is not being used it is attached to a diagnostic quality CT so it can be taking off the load of the other CT and doing just regular CTs when it's not being used for pet. And if some of you don't know, PET is a type of imaging that uses not only shows you structure and size of sort of where the cancer would be, if it's in a bone here or the liver here, but it can tell you the metabolic activity. Sometimes it can see disease that you can't see on a CT scan. And then you marry the CT images with the PET overlaying. And so you can say, oh, where there's a bit of metabolic activity here in the liver, but you don't see a mass. So it gives you a, it's like a higher level of sensitivity. Um, in, in monitoring cancer. One of the other ways where it's pet, a PET scan is really helpful is we have a lot of, of cancers like lymphoma that will shrink to a certain point but not go completely away. And so when you add this metabolic um, aspect to it, let's say um, some PET scans are done with radio-labeled glucose molecule, so the patient is injected with glucose and attached to it is a radio-labeled um, uh, fluorescent molecule. And wherever there is high metabolic activity in the body, cancer being the most metabolically active location in your body, it will take up that glucose because of its high metabolism, and then it will shine bright like a, a Christmas light. And there's different ways to grade that intensity. So when you're treating somebody with a lymphoma and their, treat, their mass only shrinks a certain amount, knowing that that metabolic activity goes down to near zero can tell you that you're even though the tumor hasn't shrunk much, can tell you that you're on to something with the chemotherapy is effective, despite a not um, marked shrinkage of the size of the cancer. So having a diagnostic um, quality PET CT in-house will really be an advantage to our program. Um, in addition, one of the things that um, I think would be great to offer is um, having a interventional radiologist come in, somebody who's not a radiologist who's responsible for reading images, but who has the capability to read images, but also the technical skill to do biopsies in the lung, in the liver, in the bone. Um, that sort of exceeds the, um, the desires and sometimes the capabilities of the radiologists here. Um, not because they don't um, want to do it, they just have done it so infrequently because we've always sent those patients either down to Idaho Falls or down to Huntsman. To have somebody that would come a couple days a month to take care of our biopsies would be really great so our patients didn't have to travel. Um, so we're looking into doing that. In a, uh, probably our more longer term goals, maybe the next five years, is to perhaps um, buy a linear accelerator um, and have a radiation oncology program on site. That would be really amazing for a woman to be diagnosed with breast cancer and to have six weeks of radiation and not have to move somewhere for those six weeks because the radiation will be nonstop Monday through Friday for six weeks at a time sometimes. So, and then um, 
one of the other things that I'm working on is getting a cancer center of excellence. We have all the components that we need to do that. We just have to you know, get familiar and do the paperwork and get the appropriate staff so that we can demonstrate our capabilities. And I think we couldn't be awarded a cancer center of excellence um, um, designation by the COC. So my husband said, add um, jokes, because it would make your talk more interesting. <laughs> so I had to find some comic. I thought this was funny. The bad news is chemo can kill you before the cancer does. The good news is the medical bills and health insurance will kill you before the chemo. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then uh, this one I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> so I'm just going to change um, directions a little bit. I was going to just tell you what I thought was really exciting in the updates um, in oncology from our four major national oncology meetings that took place this year. Um, one, there's been some interesting updates with respect to breast screening. There's definitely um, a huge push on the oncology front to de-escalate our treatments, but because we know that not one size um, fits all when it comes to breast cancer. And for the last, you know, 50 years, we've been treating every stage one breast cancer often the same way we treat a stage three breast cancers. So the big push in oncology has to been to try to personalize your care using either genetics or imaging or our other modalities to try to find ways that we can actually do less so that we cause less toxicity to the patients and have the same success rates. So I'm going to talk about some um, ways that we're de-escalating. And then um, probably the, you know, nobody's really doing research into chemotherapy anymore. I haven't seen a new chemotherapy molecule be invented. But the new sort of sexy class of drugs since immunotherapy came out is this group of drugs called antibody drug conjugates. So I was going to kind of go over what that is, because you probably will hear about them in the news. And these. Um, Drugs are being very successful in treating more cancers than just breast cancer, but today I'll talk about one in breast cancer. So Hannah did a great job outlining why breast cancer screening is important. One in eight women are going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. The earlier you, you catch the cancer, the higher likely you'll be breast cancer free and a survivor. Um, and I am like Hannah the Amer and the American Cancer Society and believe that any woman over the age of 40 should be offered a mammogram. The US Preventative Task Force is um, the reason they're taking into consideration and pushing uh, mammogram recommendations to the age of 50 is because in order for a screening test to be effective, you have to be able to catch the disease while it's still curable. And the problem is the cancers that young women get between the ages of 30 and 50 happen so fast that they occur between mammograms. So you can't screen these women at an interval that's reassuring enough to tell them that, that it's an effective screening test. So it isn't that we just want to save money and we don't think that these women get it. It's just that they get a false sense of security having their screening mammogram. But when their breast lump develops between their screening mammogram, they're less likely to go to the doctor to say, hey, this is something unusual. And so any woman, you know, whoever has a fast developing mass should know that a screening mammogram is a screening test. And if you have symptoms, that's a diagnostic mammogram. So um, they should bring that you know, to their provider. So that's the reason why there's um, different advice there. Uh, it's not just our government being stingy or... The, um, with respect to screening, um, nowadays AI seems to be all in the news. Everybody's interested about chat GPT. I think Hannah and I have a couple more years left as physicians because when they did chat GPT and they gave them board um, questions for the Board of Internal Medicine, it failed. So we have a couple more years before we get taken over. But one of the ways we've been able to use artificial intelligence, and it's probably gone um, um, back in radiology because the, um, they have CAD assisted um, programs already that help the radiologists read mammograms, but this was a trial that was done in Sweden. It was published this August in the Lancet um, Journal of Oncology, and what they found is there's a technology where we use um, AI and a computer-generated program, and the program is called MIA. It stands for Mammographic Intelligent Assessment. And so they use this program in conjunction with the radiologist reading your mammogram, and they compared it to, and the patients were randomized to um, two radiologists reading the mammogram. And AI plus a radiologist was able to detect 20% more cancers um, with that technology. So I think that AI is here. I think it's really going to help our radiologists. I don't think it's going to replace radiologists. And one of the things that we don't know from this study just because we were able to detect more early cancers, we don't know if that actually contributed to more survivors. If it was found next year with the radiologist's eyes, 
you know, is that a clinically significant tumor? And that's where the follow-up needs to be. So I think the radiologists still have a couple more years left, too. Um, I thought this was a funny joke, too. It said, I would have been here sooner if it hadn't been for early detection. <laughs> so when we talk about de-escalation of care, it's really because of this first two. Hannah showed the similar graph. Mine is a little bit different because it includes stage zero, or DCIS. That stands for ductal carcinoma in situ. That's when the cancer sort of in the duct but didn't have any access to the bloodstream or into the body, no access to the lymphatic. Lympho lymphatics, that is the stage where everybody has a curable breast cancer. You don't usually, it's very unusual if a patient were to have a recurrence from a DCIS because it didn't have access. If you cut it out, you sort of cut it out in, in whole and you sort of throw it away. I always say to my patients, it's like swallowing a penny and pooping it out. It was in your body, but it didn't have access. Like you didn't absorb it. <laughs> I don't know, it's a stupid analogy, but they, they all are like, oh yeah, yeah, but anyway. <laughs> So we already cure everybody with stage zero breast cancer. So you know we're still giving them all radiation because it reduces secondary cancers. We're doing the same types of surgery. We're offering the same medicines. Um, recently, there was a study in like 90-some women where we used a lower dose of tamoxifen to prevent breast cancer. Um, so what we're trying to do is sort of back up off on our therapy so we can reduce toxicity and still have the same survival. So in these early breast cancer patients, the next bar is our stage one breast cancers or our sort of um, stage two, which is sort of a larger breast cancer but not involving the nodes. And so those stage one and two breast cancers still have a very high five-year survival. 98% of women are cured with their current modalities. And so we're saying, gosh, if we do this good, the goal is not to decrease your care so that the numbers drop, but can we keep the numbers there and reduce the toxicity that we're, we're giving to our patients? So one of the um, most feared complications of breast cancer surgery or treatment is this thing called lymphedema. So I don't know if any of you are breast cancer survivors and unfortunately know this firsthand or if you have a loved one or if you've ever noticed anybody in the population, but lymphedema is usually due to radiation and um, surgery in the axilla or some combination of the two. Sometimes it can happen with radiation alone, sometimes it can happen with surgery alone. So we've changed our surgical techniques. We're doing now like a lymph node biopsy instead of a full dissection in the armpit. But there have been four studies um, that were published this year and presented, or that were presented this year, they actually haven't been all published. Um, where we're trying to take our early stage patients and figure out who need radiation, who needs a full axillary dissection after the surgery. So one of the interesting studies was the Cenomac trial, and it showed that just because you had node positive disease, it was sort of confirming our Z11 data, that um, just because you had a lymph node that was positive, if you had um, radiation following, you didn't need a full axillary dissection. And the difference between doing a lymph node biopsy and removing one lymph node versus taking seven out and really mucking around in there, the incidence of lymphedema is markedly decreased when you can reduce your surgery to just a lymph node biopsy. So that study sort of confirmed the data that um, we've already been um, using. There's another um, study looking at that um, same thing. Sort of the same um, theory is, is the IDEA trial. The IDEA trial is where they said, okay, who in postmenopausal women can we actually omit radiation? Right, so I'm, we're, getting, we're having patients now who can feasibly have even a lumpectomy, not a mastectomy, and maybe not need radiation. And one of the ways that they're evaluating it is the tumor needs to be a certain size and their oncotype score needs to be below a certain number. And what an oncotype is, it's actually looking at the biology of your cancer. When, when Dr. Caulfield was talking to you about the genetics of tumor and tumor suppressor genes, we also have these things called oncogenes. I like to explain them to our patients as gas pedal genes and brake pedal genes. So often what's happening with our cancer is you have this normal cell that had some damage and it either damaged a gas pedal gene, so now your gut foot is slammed on the gas pedal and the cell is dividing and replicating out of control, and you can have damage to our brake pedal genes, and sometimes you can have damage to you know, proliferative genes or um, genes that control the degree of invasion. And these sort of numbers of genes and genetic hits that you get sort of get counted on a score, and you get this score called an oncotype recurrent score. And when you get a recurrent score that's 26 or higher, that means you need chemotherapy, and they've validated that. And if you have an oncotype score of 15 or lower, you definitely don't. And if you're in the middle, 
um, and you're under 50, you need chemo. And if you're in the middle and you're over 50, you don't need chemo. So we have these ways now that we're sort of trying to figure out like who really needs it. And it's not so much a one size fits all. But in the IDEA trial, they said that if you had a low oncotype, you had breast conserve conservation surgery, meaning a lumpectomy, you have hormone positive disease, you're postmenopausal, that these women omitted radiation and had the same outcomes as women who received radiation. Now, we don't have long-term um, follow-up. We have five years right now on this data. Um, the average oncotype score on these patients was less than 11, and the median size of tumor was less than a centimeter. So this is a very specialized group of patients, but it's another way where we're taking people who are already going to do well and say, hey, can we do less? And we still do just as well. And that's really important. We don't want to hit every nail with a sledgehammer. Um, two of the other trials that I thought were really interesting was the NSABP B51 trial and the ICARO study. This is really understanding, um, this is sort of like interpreting your patient's response to treatment and then using that to guide your decision making. It's not just saying because everybody who has lymph node positive disease needs um, radiation to the axilla if they have chemotherapy up front and all their lymph nodes go away and they have surgery and there's no cancer left in the lymph nodes, those women now have been demonstrated to safely forego radiation to the armpit. Again, that's going to lower the incidence of lymphedema. That's going to take six weeks um, of this patient's life back. I mean, they'll probably still, they'll still need radiation to the breast. It's not saying they don't need radiation to the breast, but if they had node positive clinical um, node positive and they had an axillary dissection at the time of surgery after they had their chemotherapy and all the cancer got, went away, they don't need the radiation. And that's a question we hadn't had answered before. So um, we obviously only have short-term follow-up on these patients, but I think that this is a question that we have been wanting to answer for a very long time since now we have more and more effective chemotherapy regimens that we're using for our early stage high-risk breast cancers up front. So you're going to know whether or not that chemotherapy was good because you got to see the cancer just melt away and at the time of surgery it's not there. So you know those people we can sort of back down on the level of treatments that we're giving them. The ICARO study was similar, and instead of having a complete pathologic response, these women were allowed to have isolated tumor cells in their lymph nodes at the time of surgery, and they were also able to um, omit radiation. There's short-term follow-up for these, case, for these um, studies, but I'm really looking forward to long-term follow-up and being able to tailor our treatments for our patients. So that was about de-escalation. Unfortunately, we still have way too many um, breast cancer patients where their cancer comes back. If you look at our high-risk early-stage breast cancers, the stage 2s, lymph node positives, large stage 3s that are lymph node positive, um, you can have you know, five-year recurrence of 17%. And in the stage 3, oh, now I can't even read that. 43% um, of patients will have their cancer come back. So we really need to do better for these patients. And so we're changing our chemotherapy. We're changing the types of chemotherapy we're giving. We're getting smarter about the types of treatments that we're using. I could talk all night to tell you about what's interesting and ways that we've been doing it. But um, one of um, the probably biggest topics that people are interested in is something called immunotherapy. You've probably all heard about it. Um, but immunotherapy is a tool. It's a, usually an uh, intravenous medication that we use that sort of helps your immune system identify a cancer cell. If you see sort of on the picture on the left, that's a normal tumor cell, and it has sort of two sort of baseball caps. I say cell surface markers that it puts out on its surface. One of them is a marker that's not supposed to be there, but it tells them that your immune system that, hey, I play for the home team, don't kill me. And the other one is the antigen that the immune system is supposed to respond and say, hey, I'm a damaged cell, you should eat me, or at least label me for destruction. The T cell is the component of the immune system that normally surveys our body and is able to identify damaged cells and get rid of them before they become uncontrolled cancer. So what happens when we use immunotherapy, we use either anti-PD-L1 medicines, things like Keytruda you've probably heard of, or anti-PD-1 medications, things like nivolumab or Opdivo. And these medicines either sort of block the sort of feeler on the T cell, so the T cell can't identify that it's a not eat me signal, or it's a blocker on the not eat me signal so that the cancer cell can see the antigen for what it is and label the cancer cell for destruction. So these are amazing medicines. Um, we are already seeing tremendous success and improvements in our patients with kidney cancer and melanoma and bladder cancer and um, 
um, cervical cancer, immunotherapy has touched so many and, and benefited so many of our patients that often patients with stage four cancer are becoming chronic illnesses. What we, where we haven't really seen in as much of an unmet need is in the breast cancer population. And they've been trying to figure out which populations immunotherapy can help. And what they found is in the triple negative, when they give immunotherapy up front in combination with chemotherapy, we get more patients to have all the cancer go away at the time of surgery. So we're taking early, but you know, two centimeters or greater, node positive, um, triple negative breast cancers. That's a breast cancer that's named for what it's not. We don't know what's driving it. It's not the hormones. It's not HER2. It's not progesterone. It's a it's a, just a diseased cancer cell. Chemotherapy is our really only target. And when we combine that with immunotherapy up front, we cure more patients. So immunotherapy for the last few years has only been approved in the neoadjuvant setting before surgery with chemotherapy in triple negative breast cancer. But this year, they presented a study that high-risk hormone-positive patients, two different studies, one using pembrolizumab, which is Keytruda, and one using nivolumab, which is Updevo, where they took high-risk patients irrespective of their hormone status or their HER2 status and found that it was the features of being high-risk, either the high grade, like what the cancer looks like under the met, um, under the microscope, what its metabolism is, and other features that we use, lymphovascular invasion, to determine high risk. We gave them immunotherapy in combination with chemotherapy, and we had more pathologic complete responses, meaning the cancer was gone at the time of surgery. Now, that is not an accepted endpoint by the FDA to have a complete response at the time of surgery in order to get um, pembrolizumab approved in triple negative breast cancer, we actually had to show that it saved lives, that it decreased the chances of the cancer coming back, not just that it had a complete response. We know as oncologists, if you have a complete response, you're much less likely for your cancer to come back, but the FDA doesn't accept that as an endpoint. So these studies need to be followed for longer, and if it really translates out to less patients having recurrence from cancer and less patients having metastatic cancer, and patients living longer because they got the immunotherapy, then the drug can be approved. So it's really early data, but it's very exciting that it's not just triple negative, that it's really all you know, high-risk breast cancer patients may have the opportunity to have a better outcome and will be able to cure more patients. So that's one of the examples where we're trying to escalate our care in our higher-risk patients. Um, that just talked about pembrolizumab. Our, um, unfortunately, our stage four patients, these are incurable patients. Um, this is where most of our drug development starts. Um, we take our patients who have metastatic breast cancer and we see how we can lengthen their life, improve their quality of life. And one of the sort of sexiest class of drugs out there right now is called antibody drug conjugates. These drugs are um, usually made up of three different parts. They're an antibody that recognizes a certain sort of um, part of the cancer cell. It's like a part of the cancer cell that shouldn't be part of the rest of your body. So it's the antibody that binds to that area. It's usually attached to a chemotherapy molecule, and then it has a, a very strong linker so that that chemotherapy doesn't sort of like, once it gets into your body, just unleashes. What these medicines, um, what makes them so attractive and um, so beneficial for our cancer patients is the antibody acts as like a a honing device, and it looks for the cancer because it's only um, going to have binding sites for you know, certain tissue elements of your cancer. It binds to the cancer. It gets then taken up by the cell. Because of the inside of the cell has a lower pH, that stable linker that isn't stable anywhere else isn't in unstable anywhere else in your body, then becomes unstable, and it unleashes the chemotherapy. It's like a guided missile for your cancer cells. So what's really cool, this reduces our um, side effects for our patients. So what's really sort of cool and um, amazing about these drugs is very few women lose their hair. That's very important to many of my patients. Um, um, so they're introducing this drug. This drug specifically is a medicine called inher 2 um, in HER2 is a uh, HER2 antibody, so it was initially invented for patients who have HER2 positive breast cancer. It's one of the more um, aggressive breast cancers. About 20% of breast cancers are HER2 positive, so it hones in on those HER2 sites. When we say a breast cancer is HER2 positive, it means it wildly overexpresses HER2 on the surface, and so these proteins are very easy 
to find and bind, and then when they bind to those receptors, they then deliver the chemotherapy. What they found is majority of breast cancer, almost like 80% of breast cancer, is what we call HER2 low, has just a little bit of HER2 expression, and that is enough for these antibodies to find those cancer cells and deliver those chemotherapy. What's great about this medicine is of the antibody drug conjugate, the relationship and number of chemotherapy molecules attached to one antibody is very high, and it is a really very potent chemotherapy when this chemotherapy agent was studied on its own. Patients had low blood counts for seven weeks. It was like they were a cancer patient going through leukemia. Um, so it cannot be used as a chemotherapy, sort of freestanding in your body, attacking all the cells that divide and replicate. But when it's delivered um, sort of in microscopic doses directly to the tumor, because it's so potent when those cells die, it even leaks out to the neighbors that weren't her too overexpressed. So it has what we call a bystander effect. So sort of any breast cancer talk would be remiss in saying that here we have this antibody drug conjugate, the sort of guided missile for breast cancer that is now effective for almost 90% of our eligible, not everybody responds to it, but um, about 90% of our breast cancers are HER2 low. So um, it's really exciting to be an oncologist right now. We have lots of improvement to make, but it seems every day I have so much to read and learn about. And so um, looking forward to... Um, educating you all more about you know, what's coming down the pipeline and helping take better care of our patients in, in the community. So I wanna thank you all for listening. Oh, and that's just my conclusion.